Welcome to the Incomplete Skeptic, the series Sober Wise Guy. It was initiated from watching the Three Stooges, actually, when they're saying, Wise Guy. And it was all kind of a timing humorous thing. But yet in recovery, I think we do acquire some wisdom if we get out of the way. And I have with me today a person who has gotten out of the way long enough to write about 30 books. And she's in long-term recovery. And as the case with folks in long-term recovery, early on, she chose to commit her life to a spiritual path. When she so committed, her direction in life followed accordingly. And she's written a book, Change Your Mind, Change Your Life. So that would follow as well. Gentle and honest, she looks at her personal experiences and helps audiences make sense of their world and travel down their own spiritual path. She's published her first book many years ago, which I was gifted with from my parole officer back in the day. And it was titled, well, it is titled Each Day a New Beginning, Daily Meditations for Women, published by Hazel in, in 1982. And when I was gifted this book, I didn't read the daily meditations for women part. And honestly, I had the book for two or three years before I realized that it was written as meditations for women. I, I'm glad I didn't notice. I think that that is a good thing. Um, but I did wonder a couple of times going, hmm, they seem to talk a lot about women in this book. But then I thought, oh, that's all right, you know, whatever. And, uh, but she's followed her production of that first book with about 30 other books. Where are you at now, Karen? 30 books more? Just finished 31, number 31. 31. And um, it will be out in April. I mean, in May, May oh, 11th, okay. I think it's already listed on Amazon. Oh, good. It's been, it's been published by... Uh, small publisher called Mango, M-A-N-G-O. I'll have to check Mango <laughs> out maybe for my next book. Your book, the links for your book sales are available on your website, right? Yes, they are. Okay. And, and you know, I don't think Mango is on there yet because, uh, but Canari, who had published a lot of my books, along with Hazelden. Hazelden was the first publisher and then Canari published a number of them. And then Canari um, was part of Red Wheel Wiser and the Canari part of Red Wheel Wiser got sold to Mango. And, mm. but the interesting thing was is that the publisher at Mango used to be involved with uh, Harper Collins and when Hazelden first made uh, its inroad into bookstores, it was through Harper Collins. So now the publisher of uh, Mango is somebody that actually had been kind of following me literally from each day on. Huh. So um, it's it's kind of feels like I've gone back home to <laughs> roost in a new place with her. <laughs> So, you know, cool. I mean, the whole world of publishing is pretty interesting. Right. The Well, you at least have a fairly comprehensive listing. And uh, Karen's website is www.womenspirituality.com. Women's does not have a hyphen in it. It's W-O-M-E-N-S hyphen spirituality.com. If you want to follow up with her and check out a description of her books and a link to her blog. Now I've heard Karen speak quite a few times through the years. I've purchased several of her books and I think probably five books. And I've used some of her books with dealing with clients when I worked with people that were fresh out of prison or jail and found it very useful in that, in that regard. Her focus as a writer and speaker is the development of spiritual growth and strengthening one's 12-step recovery. 
her personal experience is what she relies on, coupled with wisdom gleaned from the many fellow travelers she's walked among in the rooms of, we'll say it, Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon. She's spoken to tens of thousands of people worldwide. Well, what's it been, 40 years since you've been speaking? Uh, well, I've been sober. I was sober 44 years in May. Okay. And so I, I've been, yeah, I've been out there on doing some speaking for the better part of 40 years, I suppose. Yeah. Sweet. So. Yeah, I turned 81 this past summer. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> and you're still kicking strong. You know what? Yeah. yeah. I, I see people just really happy with your presentations and books. And I, I think we could explore your story here some, if you're willing to share it from the Al-Anon and AA perspective, if you're willing to just get up and go on that one. All right, let's talk about that. What, what happened, uh, you know, what you were like, what happened and what you're like now, the proverbial thing that we do in recovery. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, well, you know, I, I um, wandered into my first 12-step meeting in 1974, and it was an Al-Anon meeting. And I had no, um, I had no idea what it meant to be codependent. I had no idea at that point in time that I was an alcoholic, as a matter of fact. Uh, I went to Al-Anon uh, as a suggestion by uh, a counselor um, treating somebody that I was involved with. And he said to me, you know, you've got a lot of furrows in your brow. <laughs> and I think that Al-Anon would be good for you. <laughs> so uh, off I went, um, fully expecting that what I would learn there was uh, how to keep somebody else from drinking. And um, I, I, I truly, I mean, it, it, it amazes me to think that I did not even realize my own addiction to alcohol and drugs at that point in time. I was so codependently focused on the behavior of this other person I was involved with. And I had been married for 12 years previously. It was a very alcoholic marriage. And um, my first husband was um, quite a philanderer. <clears throat> and again, you know, I, I had, you know, I turned to alcohol uh, at age 13, actually, as a way of finding relief for the anxiety that I felt in my family. And it was the kind of anxiety that also made me then go on the search for uh, some man, some young fellow in high school that I thought would give me a, a sense of well-being, would make me feel important, because that isn't how I felt in my family. And, um, and you know, it's, it's like the typical story of so many people. I mean, one thing leads to another. And but that first drink at age 13, I had such a sense of well-being from that drink that it seemed like the natural thing to turn to alcohol from then on. And I, my drinking was obviously out of control. But when you have somebody else to focus on whose drinking is even more out of control than your own, it's really easy to, uh, to just bypass what you're doing. And that's exactly what I had done for years and years. In that first marriage with Bill, his behavior was so outrageous that it was so easy to focus on him as the culprit, as causing all of our problems. And, um, and then I went from that marriage into one relationship after another that actually mirrored that marriage. And um, so it was really a godsend when I think about it, that the, 
relationship I ended up in that a counselor said, you know, if you want to get rid of those furrows in your brow, I think you should go to Al-Anon. And so, and this was in Minneapolis. <clears throat> and it was at the um, Unitarian Society was that first Al-Anon meeting I went to. And, you know, I went in and it was a room full of men and women and I was dumbstruck by how instantly comfortable it felt. What I, and, and I, I know we hear this from lots of people when they go into a, their first 12 step meeting. It's like that sense of feeling like, gee, I'm, I'm home, people understand me here. And I sat there that night without talking, um, just listening and soaking up this sense of hope that everybody had. And I had lived on the edge. Um, uh, I, I hadn't had hope for a long time and I lived on the edge and the dread of life day in and day out. <clears throat> and so I, I, but I did think they would send me home that night with a, a list of uh, these are the things you should do and you will keep that person from drinking. And instead, they sent me home with a little daily meditation book, One Day at a Time in Al-Anon. And uh, at this point in time, I was in graduate school working on my PhD in American studies. And I looked at this little book and I thought, oh, this is a no brainer. And I went home and I sat down and I read it from cover to cover and thought, well, I'll, I've got this figured out now. <clears throat> now everything is gonna be just fine. And uh, I went back to the next meeting because of course, like we always say to people, please come back. And I went back to the next meeting and they said, how are you? And I said, oh, I'm just fine. I finished the book. And everybody uh, got a good chuckle out of that and <laughs> said, uh, well, you know, you might want to start over <clears throat> and just read one page a day. And I, I, I mean, that had just totally, uh, I hadn't even realized that each page was dated. I hadn't even realized that that was the intent of that book. I was just so eager to figure out how to keep somebody else from drinking. And so, um, but the irony too, is that at that first meeting, I would go home with a daily meditation book. It's like, I've often thought God really um, has a great uh, sense of humor that uh, I go home with a meditation book. I had never seen anything like it before in my life. I had no idea that that would be the kind of thing that would uh, become the core of my life's work. Um, but at any rate, I continued to go to Al-Anon um, and I, I continued though to drink and um, so I ended up still having major struggles in my relationships. I mean, nobody told me in Al-Anon, you can't keep drinking. And so I, I continued to drink. So I wasn't really helpful to the partner that I was involved with. And so, um, and then, but then we ended up in couples counseling where I was told by the counselor that I simply had to not drink too. And the couples counseling, there were six couples in this group. And the, the counselor, she was just a great woman. And every week, one of the couples told their story, the, the story of their relationship struggles, how alcoholism played a role. And my partner never showed up a single week. And like the good and classic codependent, every week I showed up with a wonderful excuse as to why he couldn't be there because I was mortified that he would always say, oh, yes, yes, I'm going to come today. I'm going to come. And he never showed up. And so I was mortified at how it made me look because as a codependent, that's what life was all about. It's like how somebody else's behavior makes me look. And so I always had these wonderful excuses as to why he couldn't make it that day. After all, at the last minute, something came up at work. Well, you know, he was only partially employed. There was nothing that ever came up at work. <clears throat> so at any rate, that sixth week, the counselor said, 
Well, Karen, I'm not sure you're really in a relationship, but why don't you share with us a bit about your story? And so I began to tell the truth on myself, not even thinking that I was revealing a story of alcoholism. Uh, I mean, I, I was a daily drinker and had been for years and I loved every bit of it. And um, so I was just sharing my story quite innocently and she stopped me and said, you know, Karen, I think that, um, that it would be helpful if you went to AA. And I was kind of taken aback. It's like, what? You think I need to go to, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a thyroid condition. <clears throat> you mean I have to go to AA? And she said, I think that you might find that helpful. And she asked if, if there were any people in the group who would be willing to take me to a meeting. And you know how helpful we always are. <laughs> and so that a couple people in the group said, oh, sure, they volunteered. And I met them that next Monday and uh, outside of St. Paul's Episcopal Church by Lake of the Isles. And, um, and it was a group called 12 by 12. <clears throat> and we went in and I was just blown away. It was a group of probably 200 people. And um, I looked around and, and the room was full of men and women. And, and happily, as far as I was concerned, it appeared that there were more men than women and lots of them were quite attractive and I was kind of in the same age range I was 36 at that time and um and I looked around and I thought you know who needs that jerk I was involved with I'll pick me somebody new right here <laughs> and so I was I, I we broke up into small groups and, and I ended up going to the first step group for the newcomers. And at the end of the meeting that night, a man came up to me and he said, now I noticed that you were a newcomer in the, new, in the first step group. And I said, yes. <clears throat> and he said, now you be sure and come back next week. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is the beginning of the next relationship. And I left that meeting that night just on cloud nine, thinking my life has begun on a whole new trajectory. And, um, and fortunately, that next week when I went back, um, he, I was approached. I saw him off in the corner and he was talking to another woman. And I thought, oh, my God. Here we are, we're just starting a relationship and he's already flirting with somebody else. That's like every other man I've been involved with. I was just devastated. And fortunately, two women who remain in my life today, one named Chris and the other named Eileen, approached me that night. And I don't know if they had noticed me on week one and kind of got a, an inkling because they had a few more months of sobriety than me. I don't know if they had kind of an inkling that I was um, not there maybe for the um, most uh, pure purposes. And um, so they said, why don't we have dinner sometime real soon? And so we went to the Black Forest Inn and for dinner a couple of nights later. And I don't even know if the Black Forest Inn is, still exists there in Minneapolis, but um, it was a great restaurant, a German restaurant, and they laid down the law. And they said, you will not be involved with anybody, uh, with any man in any kind of a relationship for the first year of your recovery. You are simply here to learn how to, to stay sober and make friends and, and really strengthen your ties with women. And, um, and I must admit that I took it to heart what they said, but at the same time, I, it crossed my mind, why am I really here if I'm not here to get another man? I mean, that just seemed, I mean, my life had been about alcohol and relationships. You know, if I didn't have both, I, I always felt like I was, not measuring up. And I had not grown up in an alcoholic family. 
my father um, was a rageaholic. There were a lot of people in the family who, who I think were, um, were part of that alcoholic family tree, you know, they, they hung out there. I had a couple of uncles who were for sure alcoholic, but my dad was very, very controlled in his drinking, but he was not controlled with his anger. And so growing up in a family where you tiptoe around everything and then you kind of discover the freedom that you get from alcohol and you quit tiptoeing, life changes pretty dramatically. And that's what had happened for me. And, um, but then, you know, I, I went into AA and, and even though um, I loved every minute of it, I did not, um, I guess I wouldn't say that I felt, I felt at home while I was at a meeting, but I would leave a meeting and I would feel this, this big hole inside. Uh, I would have this real longing for the feeling that I had had while at the meeting. So it, it felt like I couldn't really connect with a God of any kind, except when I was in a meeting and in the midst of all of these others. You know, we would go at that period of time, we would always go out afterwards for coffee and dessert and stuff. And, and so that, that feeling that I had lasted the whole evening until I would go home. And, um, and that is actually what ultimately led to my writing. You know, in, I was in, as I mentioned, I was already in graduate school and I um, loved writing. Writing for me was just like falling off of a log. I mean, it, it, I mean God was speaking to me then but I didn't recognize that that's why writing was so easy. But I had, um, am I going on too long? Not at all. I'm quite Timothy? enthralled. I'm, I'm glad you took the direction of why you started writing. That was perfect. I didn't even have to ask. So thank you. Okay. Well, at any rate, I, um, because of, of the, the struggle that I was having, and I had um, decided after about 18 months of being sober, uh, I had just, I, I just was, I had been suicidal as a kid. And after about 18 months of being sober, I, I hit the wall. And um, I, I didn't have any desire to drink. I simply had no desire to live. And so I was, at that period of time, I was, taking classes, of course, and I was teaching at the university at the same time, and I just kind of quit showing up. And, uh, and one night I um, decided I was just going to turn the gas on my stove. And I rolled up all the towels I had and tucked them in all around, or was gonna tuck them in all around the windows in my little one bedroom apartment. And I didn't have any fear or trepidation whatsoever. It, it seemed like the obvious next step. Uh, I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel any, um, I didn't think of family. I didn't think of anything. I just thought, I just can't keep going this way. And so I, I was sitting at the kitchen table just ready to light a match when somebody knocked on the door. And I was startled because I, I knew that I had not planned a, a, for a visitor and um, certainly not that day, <laughs> that, that afternoon. And um, the knock came again, a little bit louder this time and I walked to the door because I lived in this big old apartment building right across from Loring Park. And, and uh, I walked to the door and said, who is it? And she said, well, it's Pat, we have an appointment. And I, I said, Pat, I, I did not have any, I didn't know anybody named Pat. And, um, but because she was talking quite loud 
and I had a very elderly neighbor next door, I thought I better open the door. And so I opened it just to crack so I could see her. And um, she kind of um, brazenly pushed herself in actually. Oh. And she was this very tall, very attractive, red haired woman with her hair all up in a bun in back. And um, she said, yes, we have an appointment, I'll show you. And she pulled out her daily planner, which is what <clears throat> everybody used for keeping appointments way back, <laughs> way back then in the 70s, uh, way before any, way before phones. And sure enough, there was my name. And she said, I'm a financial planner. And we made an appointment to discuss your finances. And I, I was just dumbstruck because I lived in a, uh, an apartment that cost me $100 a month. I taught at the University of Minnesota and made almost no money at all. I was just a lowly instructor. Um, I didn't have any money to, to really talk to a financial planner about. <clears throat> but she was quite brazen and forceful and yet kind. And she walked herself right into my kitchen, sat down at my kitchen table and said, are you okay? And uh, I said, well, no, not really. I'm, I'm feeling pretty depressed. And she said, oh, well, you know, she said, I, I know a little bit about depression. I've, I've had depression too. And I said, well, I'm a recovering alcoholic. And she said, I know a little bit about that as well. My husband is a recovering alcoholic. And so we, we had this conversation about my depression and, and she helped to identify what was going on with me. And she said, you know, there's a name for what's going on. It's called chemicalization. And she said, you can read more about it in a book by Catherine Ponder. But she said, you know, really, uh, what's happening here is um, you're just on the precipice of a, of a real spiritual awakening. And you simply have to trust to reach across where God is. And God is waiting to take your hand. And I assure you, if you just reach across, he will be there. And she talked so calmly. And uh, I, I mean, I, everything changed for me inside. I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, there, there is there is something else going on here. I'm not alone in this world. And she got up and she said, you know, she said, I think our, our business is done here. And uh, she turned around and, and reached out toward me and said, and, and went to put her arms around me. And she said, I want you to know that you're gonna be just fine. Everything is gonna be just fine. And she left. And I had never seen her before. I never saw her again. We never discussed one word about finances. I knew from the moment she left that she had been an angel sent, mm -hmm. that, that she had been on a mission, you know, and her, her assignment was to, to in, interject herself in the middle of what was really going to be the end of my life. And, um, and it was just an amazing experience. And um, I never, I would like to say that I never ever struggled with depression ever again, but that wouldn't be the truth. Uh, I, I wasn't, it was a few years yet before I actually finally went on medication uh, for depression and anxiety, because in those days in AA, in the 70s, uh, if you went on medication for depression or, or anything like that, you were considered no longer sober. And so um, I did not even go on medication until 1992. And so I had a lot of bouts of depression, but I never ever again knew that it was gonna be as bad as it had been that night. 
And what I also discovered was that when I felt called to sit down and start talking to God in my big recliner. And so that's how my writing began. That's how each day a new beginning was written. It wasn't re written ever uh, to be read by a few million other people. I was sitting down to have a conversation with God. I was sitting down to hear God so that I could be at peace because I still struggled. You know, I still struggled to have that, to maintain that feeling that I would have at a meeting. And I could recapture that in those, all those periods of time when I would sit alone and just sit and write. And I knew that God was right there with me. So I, I have spent um, a lifetime of writing books as a way of maintaining that connection. You know, I, I never have felt in, in, in all of the books that I have written, I have never felt like it was just me sitting down, just me and the computer. The first five books I wrote, I wrote longhand actually and hired a typist. And I didn't, when I've got my first computer in 1991, I thought, oh my gosh, I'll probably never write another word because I figured I couldn't write at the computer because I was so used to doing everything longhand. And, um, but, but what I knew is that whether it was longhand or at the computer, what became very apparent right away is that it wasn't just, it was never just me. It was me and the presence, the presence of God that happened to write, that, that wrote through me. And so when I look at a big stack of books that I have written, I think that, you know, they're, that's God's work. You know, I, I feel like I was the channel but that's God's work. And I just feel so grateful for every moment of my life. I feel so grateful that, uh, that I ended up with alcoholism as the disease that, that nearly took my life uh, because of the life that it has given me um, in, in retrospect. You know, I, I, I just can't, tell you how gratified I feel for the blessings that I feel in my life. And, you know, they just continue to come. But, you know, I, I've continued also, I've never in all of these 44 years of sobriety, uh, 46 years of recovery itself, starting in, in Al-Anon, I've never ever quit going to meetings. You know, I go to multiple, and I do now, I do all my meetings on Zoom. My husband and I didn't come back to Minnesota this summer because I have a, a lung disease and a, this thyroid condition. And the doctor said it was not good for me to travel this past spring. <clears throat> so we stayed put down here all year. And, um, but I am so, I feel so grateful that, all of these meetings are on Zoom. And, and so I'm going to Minneapolis meetings on Zoom and I'm going to Naples meetings on Zoom, uh, both AA and Al-Anon meetings, uh, Course in Miracles group on Zoom. And, um, you know, I mean, not that the pandemic itself hasn't had the struggles for lots of people, but I think it's also allowed a whole lot of us time to revisit our lives in a new way. And for me, this very last book I wrote uh, was I started it uh, the beginning of April because I felt like, uh, I felt kind of that emptiness beginning to develop inside. And I thought I've got to, to do more with connecting. So I started writing Facebook posts and I thought, aha, that's the missing link. 
I need to be writing another book. And so I started another meditation book. And that was the first meditation book I had written for a while. I had written, you know, change your mind and your life will follow and fearless relationships and let go now embracing detachment and, uh, you know, just a slew living long, living passionately, whole lot, 52 ways to live the course in miracles, lots of books that weren't daily books. <clears throat> and it felt like it was time to write another daily book because that's what it felt my heart needed. And so that's what this most recent book is. It's uh, another daily book on uh, meditations for a peaceful journey. And, um, so, you know, I, I just think that we all are, we are all born to do something. We're all called to do something. You've done great things with your life. You've turned your life around in, in such an incredible way, Timothy, and turned around and helped other people change their lives. And, and I think that that has been your assignment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, and we all have an assignment that too. Uh, my my sponsor rest yeah, in peace. Yeah, we all uh, have an assignment. Yeah, our timing is a little bit off here, um, but yeah, Mary Jo Robinson was my sponsor, and you know, rest her soul, she's upstairs now. <laughs> and um, and she said that Matt is my ministry, and um, and I think for a great many years it was. I I spoke for mad for 28 years and and now i'm speaking for minnesotans for yeah. safe driving and doing some things on my own as well and um but yeah she kind of pointed that out and you know in the prayer of saint francis of assisi when you were talking about being a channel he says that in his prayer is that he becomes a channel and i you know, I had a dream about you some years ago, and I don't have dreams about people very often, especially if we're not like, it's like, why would I have a dream about Karen Casey in the middle of, I mean, it's not like I heard you just speak or something. I wasn't in the middle of reading your book, but I had a really powerful spiritual dream that you were blessed by God. And I, I don't remember all the details anymore, but you were in that light that spiritual light, that white light that I recognize when I see it in a vision or when I see it in a human being sometimes. And when I prayed to God about who I should do my fifth step with because I didn't trust anybody, you know, um, God instantly showed me Mary Jo's face and it had that same white light in the very essence of her face. And it was so crystal clear. It was more clear than if you're sitting in front of somebody and looking at them. I could see every wrinkle in her face. And so it was really clear to me that God wanted me to do my fifth step and who to do it with. And I called her and I said, would you hear my fifth step? And she said, no, no, of course she said yes. And, um, but, <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't mean to just kind of take over here, uh, but I I had a um, no I had a question <clears throat> or two for you here. Um, you know you've written a lot of books yourself and you've mentioned a couple as well, but for a person in early recovery, what book would you say would be most targeting? A person's need, whether male or female, I don't know. However, you want to answer that. Um, have any suggestions, either yours or someone else's? Well, you know, I think that anybody in early recovery, um, I mean, first of all, you got to read the big book. You know, you've got to read the big book, and I think you've got to read the 12 by 12. You know, you've got to get really grounded in what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about. And I think as Bill sees it, it's a great book for people to read too. And, um, and you know, I, I, um, it was interesting that when I wrote Each Day a New Beginning, 
one of the, um, because I was trying to connect with God and because I felt like at that time, it felt to me like 24 hours wasn't speaking to me when I read that. But you know, now, isn't it funny? One of my favorite, two of my favorite meetings, we read that book uh, as the discussion topic. And that book speaks to me so much now, mm -hmm. so much more than it did in my early recovery. But I think it's such an excellent book. Richmond Walker um, really, really did. I think he, sp he spoke in a way that was really uh, a touchstone for people. <clears throat> so, and you know, another person that I love is Richard Rohr. And I don't know if you've read any of Richard Rohr's book, nope. but he wrote mm -hmm. Breathing Underwater, which is a book. Uh, which is a book that's really related to the 12 steps. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan priest who uh, isn't in recovery, but he's worked a lot with recovering people. His last name is spelled R-O-H-R, -R, Father mm -hmm. Richard Rohr. And he has meditations online every day. <clears throat> but he, he is... Um, I think that he really speaks to lots of people. I heard about him from people in recovery programs. And, um, you know, I think that one of the most influential books I ever read was a book by a woman named Carolyn Mace, M-Y-S-S. -S. Mm -hmm. And um, and she's, yeah, I just, her, her book, Sacred Contracts, mm -hmm. absolutely, um, spoke to me in such a powerful way because i would had so many experiences in my life that at the time I had them, I, I didn't understand them. You know, I, I mean, I couldn't quite make sense of them. And I had been um, a victim of, of sexual abuse as a kid and um, not in my immediate family, but in the next ring of the family. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And, um, and it was really, it was one of those things that was so distressing. Uh, and it, it still is in some respects, but, you know, I finally kind of got a better picture of what that was about with the help of Carolyn Mace's book, Sacred Contracts, because what she says in that book is that every experience we have with anybody is an experience that we have agreed with that soul prior to coming here to have for the lessons that we need and want to learn that will benefit us as well as others in this lifetime. <clears throat> and, uh, and that put a whole new um, light on that experience, that sexual abuse because what I ultimately learned, and not, not at the time, not until many years later when I was recovering and I talked about it in, with a counselor, but what I came to understand was forgiveness in a way that I'm not so sure I would ever have been um, open to the depth of the forgiveness that I ended up feeling for him. <clears throat> Let me tell you how it came about. I'm so sorry. I have mm -hmm. to keep clearing my oh, no. throat. We're fine. <clears throat> I'm going Monday. Life on life's terms. I'm going Monday to have a, a biopsy. I'm having a biopsy done on Monday on my thyroid um, because of this problem I have. And um, But at any rate, um, now I kind of lost my... Tr oh, I in this counseling that I was at, she suggested, as counselors oftentimes do, that when you feel ready, write him a letter. And so I, I ended up um, sitting down one night uh, at the computer, writing a letter, and it was an angry letter. You know, it was just pouring out my anger and my heart uh, at how violated I had felt and, and how unfair 
it was, and here I was 11 and 12 years old. I mean, what the, you know, it was just uh, unspeakable. And, um, and then after I wrote that letter, I, I felt a sense of relief. I did, I knew I would, he was still alive. In fact, I would still see him at big family gatherings. Um, and never, obviously never was anything ever discussed. He never ever acknowledged anything. <clears throat> and I had never told anybody because I was afraid to tell. I was afraid my family wouldn't really believe me or that they would mm -hmm. think that somehow it was my fault. I mean, you know, that's, you, you grow up in a family where, where uh, you were tiptoeing around all the time because of the anger that's rampant in the family and you assume you're gonna get blamed for something. And so I never told anybody, but a few nights after writing him that letter, I had this strong pull to sit down at my computer. And, and I was so unprepared for what came next because it was as though I would, was automatic writing. And it was a letter, Dear Karen, it started Dear Karen and mm -hmm. he was writing to me. Hmm. And it was, I was like transformed. And I just sat there and I just let all of this flow. And he, he explained to me his childhood, his own sexual abuse and how sorry he was for what had transpired and could I please forgive him? And I mean, it was just an unbelievable thing. And, and when it was over, when I, we got to the end of it, I mean, I just sat there and kind of shook and cried. And I printed out the letter and took it downstairs and showed my husband um, because he had known, uh, I had shared with him all of this. And, um, and he said, now maybe you can finally let this go. And, and I was, I was able to let it go. And I was really able to look at this man with utter forgiveness. And I, I knew that somehow Carolyn Mace was right, that the lesson for me had been a, a, a deeper understanding of forgiveness so that then I would have a, an opportunity to maybe share that story with others so that they could reach a place of forgiveness too. It's, it's such a powerful idea that we make these contracts with other souls so that we can then have experiences that we will both benefit from. And then as a result of how we benefit, we turn around and help others to benefit by passing forward what we have learned. So, so I, I felt like her book uh, was really one of those crucial books in my life, in my own recovering life. Thank so, you for that. Um, I've written or I've um, read quite a few of her books. I, I'm an auditory learner, so I tend to listen to the books. And when I was going through the Dark Night of the Soul, which lasted about three and a half years, and it was a very difficult journey, her book, Spiritual Madness, was there the whole time. Sacred Contracts, I got that about the same time. Archetypes and etc. I mean, I just have so many of her works that have impacted my life that uh, I get excited when I hear someone say Carolyn Mace and even pronounce her name right. <laughs> but yeah. she, yeah, she's really shifted. Yeah, she does a lot on Yeah, she's, she is, she's just brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, she does a, a lot of, um, of programs online too. Yeah. So. Pebbles but in the I well wanted to correct stuff. one yeah, yeah. thing because you said you said uh, change your mind, change your life, and actually that was a book written uh, by um, 
Oh God, his name is suddenly escaping me, but my book is change your mind and your life will follow. Yeah, I realized so so later who that maybe I listens to this. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for yeah. correcting me on that. Yeah, I... that was written by. Yeah, yeah. This, the, this the guy is where who wrote that book is. is so famous. He died. Mm -hmm. The guy who wrote that book is so doggone famous, and his, and his name is utterly escaping me right now. And I'm embarrassed to admit that, but change your mind, change your life. Uh, Dwyer, Dyer, oh, Wayne, Wayne Dyer wrote that book. Yeah. Got it. So yeah. He wrote a lot of great books. I remember he speak on the University of Minnesota campus before he ever, uh, this was probably when I was just starting graduate school. Uh, and it was before he ever really made a big splash in his life. And I heard him speak in a small auditorium. And um, I can't remember anymore what book he might have been talking about. I think it was his first book. And I think he was carrying them around in the trunk of his car. And uh, it's just kind of amazing then, you know, what happened with his life. You know, he, he touched so many people. Amen. A woman too. He, um, I listened to one of his meditations as well that he used to listen to, um, the I am uh, tones, you know, and it's just a vibratory type of meditation and very peaceful. He, he had um, his story about being in an orphanage reminded me, it's like it paralleled my life. So he really got my attention with that story. And, you know, we have so many things in common with those along our paths. And, you know, right now I have a friend who's reaching out to me, but I'm not really sure how I'm going to deal with this, but she was sexually abused as a child. And She's almost my age and she's still in pain. And it's like, I don't, I, I'm a guy. I don't know that I'm the right one to be uh, going down this, this road with her. But then on the other hand, I just trust creator. I trust my God. And I don't view myself as a male or a female when it comes to recovery and spirituality. And I might physically be a male, but I just... I just don't have that type of consciousness usually. And so, you know, it'll probably be fine, but I'm really glad you took this direction and it gave me some ideas what I'll do. I think I'll talk to her about the Carolyn Mace. I, I think that's one of those divine connections where this is what spirit is saying that I'm supposed to maybe pass on to her is, is sacred contracts. So that, that might yeah. be her holiday gift. I'll right. get the audio book and send it to her. And that way, Carolyn gets to do the work. And, yeah. you know, so. All right, right. And as my sponsor um, used to say that God meets us where we're at and doesn't really care what our gender or race and orientation is and politics and and that's a hard pill to swallow these days for some people. But for me, it, all those things are an outside issue, you know, and it's a we program. So I, I, that's where I learned to set these things aside. And I, I have opinions about some of them. And it's certainly not my role here to even discuss what those opinions are. They're, it's, it's not relevant. But I learned to just embrace right. and love people regardless of their belief systems. And, you know, in early recovery, I, I was a racist and people, I didn't go around bragging about it, you know, but the people that knew, they just said, keep coming back, keep coming back. There's only one requirement yeah. for membership. And it's not that you're not, it's, you're racist. Okay, you want to stop drinking? Come on back. 
And um, eventually people loved me back to health. And I didn't realize that I, I was so full of self-loathing that that's where the racism was really born. And I, I was brainwashed in prison. That's where, but the reason that was even possible is because of the self-loathing that I had for myself. Because how can you have such a, a rage against someone without it harming you and you're permitting it? You know what, you know what I'm saying? Um, so now I try Ooh, to, I yeah, I just try to accept if somebody comes into AA or Al-Anon that has whatever issue they have, I'm good with that. You know, we just, we meet them where they're at and we just love. That's all we do is just love. So, um, and you know, that's what I like so much. That's what I like so much about the Course in Miracles, too, which I think is such a, a, a nice, uh, I think it weaves its way so nicely into both, uh, into the 12 step programs, uh, because I think it's a real complementary uh, uh, path. And its focus is simply everything is either an expression of love or a call for healing and help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is such a, that clarifies for me what I am observing in others as well as myself. And when I know that any cry for help is really an invitation to me to express love in return, it, it simplifies how I can look at life. It simplifies how I can live my life moment by moment. Right on. I, I've been studying the course as well. And um, I don't even know that this is visible here, but I have a Sunday meeting and we're reading this oh, book yeah. together and, you know, and uh ACIM, of course, A Course in Miracles, for those that might not know what that means, was uh, I, I loved the people that were there. And anyone who's ever followed the course, there was just my intuition, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of my, my heart, just loved those people. It's just like, ah, oh, I love you, you know? And I felt really peaceful around anyone practicing the course. So it's like, that's what I listen to is the, the Holy Spirit, you know, and. Well, you know, I think that one of the most important books that I have written among, from all of them is this one, 52 Ways to Live A Course in Miracles. And I don't know if, if, you've, if you're familiar with this one. Yes, you, know, you I signed wrote that book A few years ago, in fact, way yeah. back in 19, did I? Oh, way here, back no, no, in no. 1995 no, is this one. Is, I, this is the one I have. I take it. Oh, back. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wrote that originally in 1995, right? But this one was just written a couple years ago, and um, and it's really there are a, a lot of study groups that developed out of the retreat. Out the women's groups at the retreat developed lots of study groups. Um, that base themselves on this book. Mm. And so I, um, you know, it's, I, I think the more we could just simplify our lives and say, okay, do I want to lead from a place of love? Or do I, do I want the ego to carry me off mm -hmm. on some crazy trajectory? And we've all done that. You know, we've all done that. That's where we lived before we got into the rooms of recovery. And most of us keep making the choice to step away from that. But I, I love the way A Course in Miracles really um, brings that point home again and again and again. Now, I haven't read A Course, the one you held up about mm -hmm. The Course in course Love, but love. I'm quite yeah. familiar with it. Uh, I know that there are study groups. Uh, in fact, I know there are some study groups down here in Florida using that book. Hmm. So, yeah, I've sat down with Mary. The yeah, there's so the much yeah. help. 
Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's from St. Paul. She's a local yokel. And I live in Minneapolis. And I gave oh. a speech at Miracle House in St. Paul when I had cancer. And I brought my book there. And um, she bought a copy of my book. And later she wrote one. And now I have a copy of the book she channeled. <laughs> it's a very interesting book. Oh, that's mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So tell me something humorous. So now from, how is your progress? Say it again. Oh, my, my. No, how is your progress? How is your um, progress with cancer? I, I was doing a lot of praying and I was trying to decide if I wanted to stay in earth, earth school any longer. I didn't know if my mission was over. And, you know, Carolyn Mace refers to it as Earth School, and I resonated with it, so I kind of ran with that. And um, and I was in, I embarked on the Power of Eight group with Lynn McTaggart, and I was, we had, you know, a group of eight people in our group, and we, you know, she had a national, international thing, and then everyone broke into eight groups and follow, followed up weekly after that. And then they would do an intention for one person each week and do that every day. And I was the first one because I had cancer at the time. And between the, the, the prayers and the intention group, the manifesting and um, in changing my mind and, and just felt like I decided I was going to be here. I mean, I could even see the spirits in heaven waiting for me. I had a choice. I was between worlds. It's like I was in the veil and I could see and experience both worlds at once. And I, I just decided to stay. So now I'm in, it's been two years cancer free and I don't know what tomorrow holds. And, you know, um, there's been some, some challenges, uh, you know, the, the radiation to keep me, I, I radiated, but I didn't use chemo. Um, so it damaged the tissues in the area that I had the radiation and there's some, you know, problems from that. But, you know, now I'm trying to figure out, well, what's next? And I think maybe I'll write another book and, yeah. <laughs> you know, and use this, uh, this downtime for that and and this is where i wanted to start the incomplete yeah. skeptic too and sober wise guy the incomplete skeptic was born in my consciousness some years ago and i wanted to speak to marginalized people and and talk about marginalized ideas um you know whether people believe in um reincarnation or um I think recovery communities are sometimes marginalized, you know, people uh, saying that it's a disease is almost like a trigger word for people and a lot of um, judgment, you know, the world seems to be addicted to judgment on so many levels and, and I'm trying to just kind of edge that door open a little bit for people and give the people that don't have a voice, a chance to have a voice with a capital V, you know, and um, so uh, it's like a friend of mine, his, his grandmother died and came to him in his bedroom after she died and said, hasta la vista, baby, I love you, you know? And she went around probably to a lot of people. And the next morning, he didn't know if it was a dream or what. Next morning, he was sitting with the family at, at breakfast and they says, oh, grandma died, you know? And, um, and he said, he said, oh, that's when he realized it was real. So we discussed that and some other spiritual experiences he's had. And um, I talked to a woman who wrote another book on marginalized people that have been in prison. And um, she generally is helping the black community, the African-American communities and people of color. And she used to be an attorney, public defender and the like. Um, you know, we're on the same page, you know, and, and in so many ways. 
but yeah, I don't know. That's kind of where I'm at now. I feel like I'm, I'm up and I'm drawing air and God's got a plan for my life. And um, I'll visit Mary Jo someday. Don't know when. You Did you ever meet Mary Jo Robinson? No? No. Okay, okay. The um, she no. she started Christ Recovery Center in Minneapolis, and she didn't follow the course or anything like that. But I'm sure she would be okay with whatever people are doing to have a good life. And um, you know, I had a female sponsor. Uh, you know, I was abused as a child too, and I really didn't want a male sponsor. You know, and I I struggled with that for quite a while and but i had a huge miracle happen in my life and i and i wrote about it in my book i um healing from my sexual abuse and forgiving my sexual abuser and boy i tell you forgiveness is is yeah. more powerful than the offense that calls it into into place you know and um i didn't I didn't think I'd ever be able to forgive him. I didn't think I could ever love the person that abused me. And I thought about killing him and hurting him and all kinds of sick stuff was in my, you know, consciousness around that. Um, sure. But then God put that love in my heart and the forgiveness for this man. And I, it was a beautiful moment. And, you know, and I think you've experienced something similar. And if I wouldn't have been in recovery, that would have never happened. Yeah. You know, and Mary Jo sat down with me and my offender when he wanted to make amends. And that's, you know, when he walked in the door of the public establishment where we are going to meet, that's when the Holy Spirit um, sent, God sent love down from heaven. And every color of the rainbow, every color imaginable came down like liquid uh, raindrops at a 45 degree angle and um it's like holy fire you know and it just filled my heart with love as soon as i looked at him it was bam my heart was full of love for this person and um when we sat down at the table and he said what he said he said can you forgive me and i said forgive you i love you and 15 minutes earlier i couldn't have said that you know, I would have probably read him the riot act or something. I don't know what I would have did. And Mary Jo says, you know, you're, he's here to make his amends. And when someone wants to get well, no one has a right to be an obstacle to their getting well. We got to let them do it. We got to forgive them. And we forgive regardless of the temperature of our hearts. Yeah. It's something she quoted Corey Ten Boom with so many times. And so, yeah, recovery lifesaver man um yeah is there any we're, we should probably wrap it up here is there any last parting idea you would like to um maybe leave us with or some maybe a humorous story and then a parting idea from your life something that just makes you laugh every time you think of it or your audiences Well, no. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I wasn't expecting that. Right. Yeah, I wanted to no, catch you but, off guard. You know, I guess the, the, <laughs> the final idea, I guess I would just like to say to anybody that might tune into this is um, just be grateful for every step of the journey because mm -hmm. every step of the journey has been intentional. And I... I um, believe that there are no accidental visitors on our pathway that everybody who shows up is there on assignment and uh and that part of that assignment is for them as well as for each of us and and that that really um changes how i look at every experience i have and I think that that can change how we look at every experience that everybody, that everybody has, you know, just there are no accidental visitors on the journey. Mm -hmm. We all need to be exactly where we are right now. 
And we all need to be meeting and experiencing exactly what we're experiencing right now in order to wake up tomorrow and be ready for what's going to come then. You know, uh, and yeah. that just thrills me. It means that every moment is perfect as it is. Amen. Well, maybe we'll see you speak back at Second Sunday again someday once they release everything and Maybe I'll get up there to speak again someday too. Know. Right, right. But I like this. I like this Zoom thing. Well, thank you once again, Karen Casey, yeah, for. Thank you once again for touching so many people's lives, you and you're very welcome. And I want to thank, thank you my. For the you know, you're a we are miracle you, you've workers. You've had a remarkable journey, and you've. So Ladies and you're gentlemen, quite a, quite a human being, Timothy. Likewise. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to the Incomplete Skeptic, another episode of the Sober Wise Guy. And I would invite you back for our next episode, whatever that might be. We'll see. Peace out. I love you all. Thanks again, Karen. Thank you, Timothy.